please be seated. At this time, Children's Church will be dismissed through the back door. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Been waiting all week for the opportunity to preach this message. And so if you'll open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. We'll make a few preliminary comments after we read our text and pray. And then we'll get right into our message. And our message this morning is going to be the same message that we've preached for the last two weeks. And so preaching the same message again in case you're wondering. Uh, anyway, Mark chapter 10 and verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized, with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they were became to be, began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But so shall it not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him, or it shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. This morning I'd like to preach a message on biblical greatness. Biblical greatness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us this morning to get the point of this message. To God, not in our heads. Lord, I think we understand what greatness is in our minds right now. But Lord, to understand what greatness is in heaven, I ask that you would just begin to transform us today. Begin to teach us and to show us what it means to be great according to God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we looked at the, the disciples uh, as they are traveling with Jesus and walking down the road. They've had a dispute among themselves and they were arguing and um, it had been right after Jesus had tried to explain to them what greatness was from the Scripture. And, and uh, when they got to where they were going, the disciples, uh, they, they, uh, Jesus asked them a question. He said, what was it that you disputed among yourselves while you're by the way? And they didn't say anything at all. They didn't have an answer for it. And the reason was they knew that what they desired was not right. They knew that what they desired... Uh, was not right. By the way, I made a point a couple of, of weeks ago, and I still believe this. All of us desire greatness. All of us desire greatness. And uh, all of us desire to be served. Now, from the world's perspective, greatness is recognition from man in a way that puts us in a position which sets us apart from others and ultimately causes individuals to serve us. Greatness in the world's eyes is our being served. Um, I, I saw something I, I, several years ago. Um, I, I was in a, in a salvage yard in, up in Delray Beach, and it was a, um, I don't know if I, sh I guess i be careful how I phrase this, but it seemed as though the individuals that ran the salvage yard uh, belonged like in an Al Capone movie or something like that. And um, it, it seemed as though the place was a front. And the reason I say that is just because of the accent and the mannerisms of the people that ran it. And uh, it just, I, I enjoyed being there. But 
while I was there and I was waiting to be, um, waiting to, I don't remember, I think I was there to get some cars for a teen activity that we were going to crash or something like that. I don't remember why I was there, but I think that was why. But while I was there, uh, one of the men, he was about my age, and uh, he was talking on the phone like to an uncle. And uh, when you've got, uh, I think it's called Gamora or Gamora and the Napolitan, or the, we call it the uh, Mafia uh, family. When you've got family, they're all very close, uh, tightly knit, and um, very expressive of love and emotion and that sort of thing. And evidently this man had an older uncle or someone that was on the phone with him, and it had been his birthday the day before. And he was telling him how, about how wonderful his birthday had been. And what this man did was he went to a spa now for his birthday, and he was describing how wonderful it was to go to the spa. Here's a guy, you know, he's kind of got the rough demeanor and appearance and all this, and he's talking about for his birthday he went to a spa, and he was talking about everything they did for him at the spa. And they did like a whatever you do to your face and whatever you do to your hands. And, like, and I just thought this doesn't fit with this guy here. But what was so great about his going to the spa was, and that's what they call those things, right? Okay. Um, was that everybody did everything for him all day. They just pampered him. Pampered a guy. Um, and, and treated him like a king, as he described. And he was just telling his uncle all about it and how great his birthday was because of what everybody did for him. Now, my thought on the matter was that if I were to be served or have something done for me, that's not the sort of thing that I would like. But everybody's different, right? And, uh, you know, we, we're just not all the same. And uh, some of you ladies like things like that. And uh, to be treated special. But I think the thing that makes a spa special, I, I don't know this from personal experience, but from what this um, fellow seemed to be expressing was that people served him all day. Or he had a day in which he was the most important person and everybody else was all about him and serving him. Obviously, they had motivation to serve him, and the motivation was probably financial, in my guess. But uh, I think his uncle that was from up north had paid for this for him. Had ordered it for his birthday. And so he was describing it, just telling him how wonderful it was. And um, standing in front of me, shamelessly describing being in a... And I just thought, man, you know... <laughs> I don't know. You know. Some things you just think people would be ashamed to say in front of you. And, uh, you know, but he talked about it. Uh, listen, don't, don't be un unkind in your thoughts toward me, but I come from a rougher generation, I suppose. Maybe my generation wasn't rough, but I come from rougher people um, than that. And guy, dudes just don't do that, do they, Brother Ken? That's just not right. And so, um, anyway, uh, so in, in, in the, my point in this is, is this. I think if we were to describe what it would be to be great would be to have people do for us, be in a position where because of our position and our accomplishments, people would serve us all the time. People would do for us constantly. I want this, somebody gets it. I want to do that, somebody makes it possible. And uh, I come somewhere and I'm treated with respect and people recognize who I am. And I've been with people before that are, that are um, I guess, I don't know how to put it, but, but they're accomplished, they're very wealthy. And it's interesting when you're with someone that's really wealthy, how they're treated everywhere they go. Everywhere they go, people know who they are. They go to places, they frequent places where people know who they are, and it's, yes, sir, yes, mister, can I do for, let me, and just people just hand over foot trying to do everything they can for them because of their accomplishments or because of, from man's perspective, greatness. So Jesus' disciples have, we've looked at the last two weeks, have kind of fallen down in this matter of understanding what greatness was from God's perspective. Last week we saw that Jesus set a child in front of them and uh, he said to them, if you want to be great, he says, do unto this child. The person who's the greatest is a person that serves a child. Now we don't think of, now I know that we've got some silly messed up thinking about child raising. It just predominates our society and that is that a child runs the family. And uh, you know, everything you do in life is all about your children. And a lot of families function and run that way as though it's all about the children. Then the children are raised and they leave the home and then the parents don't have any more purpose in life because they've raised their children. You know what will happen if you raise your child? He'll become an adult. And if 
Serving children is all that life is about. Like, everybody loses purpose at the age of 18. Right? I mean, at the age of 18, his purpose is to serve his children. Purpose and purpose and purpose. And that's kind of the world's philosophy. It's, it's, it's uh, one of those philosophies that tries to make us feel good about ourselves because we do something that's not natural, better works than usual, and by trying to do right by our children. And most people, in the name of, doing, of, of serving their children, uh, neglect their children terribly in doing so. They allow their children to do whatever they want to. They never discipline them, never break their will, never deny them anything. Uh, they serve them and, and give them whatever they want to. And, and the end result is that the child thinks the world revolves around him and um, he thinks that greatness is about being served. And he never comprehends what life really is about and what God's view of greatness is. Don't ever do that to your children. Be careful with your children about spoiling them and about doing for them in a way that makes them think that life is about being served. If they come away with the impression that life is about being served, they'll never get this truth that Jesus is trying to teach His disciples in the Scripture. Okay, now, to what brings us into our, our passage of Scripture, uh, there's been a number of events that have happened in between, but it is interesting that as God uses Mark, John Mark, this apostle, to pen the Scripture here under the influence of the Holy Spirit, it's interesting the perspective of what Mark's gospel of Jesus was. You would think that the point about being a servant would have been made in the Scripture up to now. You say, Pastor, it has been made. You don't need to preach three weeks in a row on the same thing. It's interesting that this theme is not taught once in the gospel of Mark. It's interesting that this theme is not articulated and explained one time in the Gospel of Mark, but is underlining, underlying all the way through this book. And so I would submit to you this morning that this is part of the point that Mark wanted to get across when he was saying this is what the Gospel is. This is what Jesus is. And this is what the Gospel and who Jesus was to Mark. Mark came to understand by the time that Christ had gone to the cross and was buried and rose again and ascended into heaven and gave His disciples and uh, his, his followers their commission to go and preach the gospel throughout the world, Mark came to understand that greatness is serving. And he came to understand that because Jesus taught it over and over and over again. And I would submit to you this morning that there is a difference between understanding what biblical greatness is and being transformed to thinking this is what biblical greatness is. You see, transformation means our thoughts have changed. Transformation means our thoughts, the way we used to think, we don't think anymore. We've been transformed. We've been made into something different. And the Christian life, in the Christian life, that process is called sanctification. Sanctification is a word that means cleansing or cleaning. And what we, Christ is doing and accomplishing in the life of Christians throughout our uh, Christian growth, and I, I, I don't, don't misunderstand the statement, but throughout our Christian experience is a sanctification or cleaning up process. In other words, we're born wicked. We're born wicked. The Bible says all men are liars. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And uh, so when we start, when when. God saves us and He gives us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then in the sanctification process, is, is conforming us to the image of His Son, which we're all predestinated to do. God say, everyone who's ever been saved, God's plan for them is to make them like Jesus. In the cleaning up sanctification process, we find that God's desire is to take what we were and make us what we're supposed to be. Let me submit to you this morning the truth about what we were. What we were before Jesus saved us, my friend, the Bible calls filthy rags. And it's not just talking about just us, but it's, it's talking about our very best. The Bible says that before we came to Christ, our righteousness, the very best things we could do, our good deeds, were filthy rags. And the, and the uh, description, the picture of filthy rags carries with it all kinds of disgusting, rotten, putrid uh, descriptions that I won't uh, go into uh, this morning, both for sake of time and because uh, we don't all need to be disgusted. But you just think of, of rot, and you think of, um, of uh, just 
discussing, off-scouring, and God says about the very best that we can do before Jesus, that it is like filthy rags. It is unacceptable to God Almighty. So that's what we start as. But we as Christians are in a process called sanctification or cleansing. God's cleaning us up and making us what the Bible says are fit vessels. Now a vessel is a... Uh, it is something that carries. Here we have a, an offering vessel. That it, this is an offering plate, and the purpose of this is to um, carry something, to take up an offering. It's just the closest thing that I could grab. Uh, and there's all kinds of vessels. There's vessels that we drink out of. There are vessels that we store things in. There are vessels that we throw things in when we're done with them. There are all different kind of vessels. But a full vessel... It can't accomplish its purpose. And let me illustrate it this way. I have here an offering plate in my hand. If this morning I were to ask Brother Charlie to take up the offering, what's the purpose of the offering in this church? I would submit to you that the purpose of the offering in our church is not for us to have a lot of money. It's not the purpose. It's not the reason for it. Mrs. Flanagan said to serve God. Uh, if you study the Bible on it, the fact is, is that giving... To ministry carries, but that's not what I'm preaching about. I'm just illustrating a vessel this morning. So um, this is one of these things that Tony likes to take and title a message. He gets something that's uh, like I mentioned by way of, of a side, and he takes a cut of it and makes some kind of vet, uh, of uh, YouTube video to aggravate people with. Tony, don't aggravate people with my illustration this morning. It's illustration is not what the point of this message is. Um, let's just see. Are you there? Where's Tony? Pop up so we can see your face. Okay, there he is. All right, um, so this is a vessel. I would submit to you this morning, if this, if this offering plate were heaped over, piled over with $100 bills, it wouldn't be any good for taking up the offering. The purpose in our offering this morning is to worship the Lord. And what we need to take up an offering with, in other words, we're gonna, we, we, are, it is, it, we demonstrate obedience to God in giving in the offering. We demonstrate faith in His ability to provide for us as we trust Him to obey to give in the offering. And ultimately, the purpose of the offering in our church, if we were to just summarize it in one word, is worship. We take up an offering to worship God. Uh, it's how we pay the bills in our church. The Bible says take up an offering for the work of the saints. Take up an offering uh, for the ministering of the saints, for the, for the work of the ministry. It's the sort of thing that you do to take up an offering for. Do you know if this vessel were full of $100 bills, tightly banded together, it wouldn't be any good for taking up an offering. You say, Pastor, if it were full of $100 bills, we wouldn't need to take up an offering. I know it would defeat our ability to worship God. You see, what we need to do God's work in our ministry is an empty vessel. An empty vessel is one that gets filled with what it's supposed to be filled with. When you and I are born, we're full of things. And the very best of what we're full of, my friend, is filthy rags. Off-scouring is cast off, is worthlessness, but we're full of it. And what God wants us to be is emptied so that we can be filled with His Spirit. That's why in, the, in 1 and 2 Corinthians when it says over and over and again, Know ye not that you're the temple of God and God's Spirit dwelleth in you? God lives in us. And in order for God to live in us, we must be empty vessels. And I would submit to you that if Jesus' disciples were transformed by this idea of Christ-likeness is servitude. Greatness is serving. Greatness is not being served, it is serving. If his disciples were transformed by that concept, Jesus wouldn't have had to teach it over and over and over and over again. And so because we're made out of the same kind of filth they're made out of, I would submit to you this morning that it is appropriate for us to preach the same truth until we're transformed by it. In other words, what good does it do to know what greatness is if we are not great in God's sight? What good is it for us to know that greatness is not being served, but greatness is serving from God's perspective? And that's where we find the disciples, James and John, who are a part of the inner circle of the disciples. They're those disciples that in the book of John, John said were the, he was the disciples who Jesus loved. 
These, are, these two fellows are brothers. There's the sons of Zebedee. And along with Peter, these three are the closest to the Lord Jesus. They know him very well. They're very intimate. And it's not inappropriate for them to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you do something for us that's very special? By the way, when you know God, it's kind of neat to be able to go to God and say, God, would you do something? But think about it. What can God do? I'm not talking about what you think God can do. I mean, in reality, what can God do? Say it again. Anything. So James and John have come with a correct attitude to the right person to go to about this matter. In other words, you're going to go to anybody in the world to get something done. The Son of God is the right person to go to, is it not? We go to God through God the Son. And so they come to Jesus, the disciples do, James and John, these sons of Zebedee, and they say, Jesus, we would like to ask you something. We want something from you. Mark says, we've already learned this. We've learned this in the Gospel of Mark. And here's what they asked him. Master, we would that thou shouldst do for us. I'm in verse 35 of chapter 10 of John, of Mark, I mean to say. We would that thou shouldst do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? What do you want? What would you like me to do? Now it's interesting, is it not, that they've come to the person who has modeled servanthood? The one who has been willing to give up the place that was rightfully his for a place that was not rightfully his. Jesus gave up his position as God the Son. By the way, he's still God. Don't take and make some false doctrine out of what I'm preaching this morning. I'm not saying whatever you think I'm saying about that. Jesus was fully God, but he became our sin. He became sin for us. The Bible says that. Didn't deserve it. And friend, it was not a promotion. So that we could, who are the ones that Jesus became our sin, we could be made the righteousness of God in Him. So He traded our filthiness for His righteousness. That's a demonstration of servitude. So when the disciples come to Jesus, understand the kind of Savior and the kind of person they knew. The kind of person that would become sin for them. I mean, he loved them. We'd agree with that, wouldn't we, this morning? Mm -hmm. He was willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice to demonstrate his love and God's love for them. And there's no, no argument about that this morning, friend. He, it's, it's already done. He already proved that. Can't de there's no debate about something that's proved. And Jesus proved that he loved us when he became sin for us. He said unto them, What would you that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. Now it surprises me, surprises me their lack of ambition here. Their lack of ambition startles me just a little bit. In other words, when Jesus has become, come into his kingdom, where he's ruling and reigning over the earth, and the whole world is in submission to Jesus, and he's the king of kings, not only because of who he is, but he's the king of kings because of what he's doing. He's reigning over the whole world. And they say to him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and one on the left. And it's interesting that they, when they came to Jesus to ask this question, there's several things that I find interesting. First of which, I find interesting um, that they didn't have an agreement on who got to sit on the right and who got to sit on the left. Which one was older? I suppose that would have settled it, but probably not. Um, I think that both of them probably in their mind thought, I'll be the one on the right. Because the right is the higher position, the left is the lower position. And so both of them probably thought, but they thought, well, we'll settle this later after Jesus you know, grants it. I'm surprised, though, at their lack of ambition for a, a, uh, a second reason, and that is that why would you ask for that? Why not say, Jesus, since you've got this concept of servitude, let me sit on your throne and you can sit on my right. And John can sit on the left. Or from James's perspective, and James can sit on the left. I mean, if you're going to ask to be number one next to God's son, why not go all the way? I understand you, you, the reason they wouldn't have done that was because that would have sounded blasphemous, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be a little blasphemous? To ask the Son of God 
to serve them? Well, not according to what Jesus taught. It wouldn't. He came to serve. He came not, the Bible says, to be ministered unto, but to minister. Minister is a word that means serve. He came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. He came to be a sacrifice. But they're going to allow him in the kingdom to be king. And I think that is um, appropriate. But uh, not only appropriate, but it's fitting. But it, they still had the audacity to ask to be number one and number two. Or number two and number three if Jesus is one or two. But what they're thinking is the highest possibility I want to be, which means number one. And so these fellows, though they lacked the ambition to ask to be king, to ask to be Christ, um, they didn't lack the ambition to ask to be on his right or left hand. So they're fairly ambitious. Matter of fact, more ambitious than the rest of the twelve. Now look at this. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Jesus said to his disciples, you don't know what you're asking for. You don't know what you're asking for. And I think that we could state it a little more adamantly to say, you're asking for the wrong thing. This is not what you should be asking for. You're asking to be served. You're not asking to serve. And so he says this to them, and he asks them a question which if you and I were to answer, we would say probably, I think our immediate answer would be no, but they'd half gotten their lesson. They, their, their thinking was halfway transformed. And the question was, can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? This cup is indicative of two things. This cup indicates two things. First of all, the cup indicates, if you will, this morning physically, the literal physical cup that Jesus drank with. And uh, his disciples had drank from his cup before. So physically, literally, there's the literal cup, and this would be like, uh, similar to the Lord's Supper. When he has the cup and he shares the cup, he says, when you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. And the question was, can you drink from the same cup that I drink from? And the answer is, I can do that. Yes, I can. But we know that the cup many times was referred to as the cup which God had called upon him to suffer. And a, a loose explanation or a general explanation of it was the cup of becoming sin for mankind and dying on the cross. Now, ultimately, the disciples could not become sin for someone else, but both of these men proved that they could suffer and die for Jesus. Both of these men uh, were killed for serving Jesus Christ. They were killed because they served Jesus. So to ask the question, can you, are you able to, drink the cup that I drink of, the answer in both cases is yes. And they were correct about it. And they said, can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And uh, if you study the scripture, you'll find that Jesus said, every man that cometh to me, or everyone that wanteth, whosoever will, let him come to me, uh, everyone that thirsts, and I'll give him to drink, and out of his belly shall flow live, rivers of living water. And John said that what Jesus meant by that was that they literally physically would have God's Spirit flowing out of them. And when Jesus asked his disciples, can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with, they had been baptized in the way that Jesus was physically baptized. But not only had they been physically baptized, but they had had God's Holy Spirit. It's power given to them so much so that they could cast out devils and they could do miracles in the name of Jesus. And so the answer to the question is yes. Now, from the disciples' perspective, don't be unkind to them. Think about this right now. In other words, if they want to sit and rule and reign with Jesus, they need to be able to be qualified for the position. And if you want to just summarize the question, the question is, can you do the job? In other words, if you want to sit on my right hand and on my left hand, that's a ruling, reigning position. And the question is, can you get the job done? Are you, are you capable of doing it? 
Now, obviously, without God's help, they wouldn't be capable of it. They'd never be in the place without God's help. They'd never make it to sit on the right and left hand of Jesus in His kingdom. Understand that? But with God's help, they could. And of course, I mean, He's going to be sitting right there beside them. And so anything they couldn't do, what do they do? They look to the right or look to the left, and there's the one who can do it all, Jesus. So the answer is yes. And Jesus said, He saith unto them, said unto them, they said unto him, in verse 39, we can, and Jesus saith, said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Yes, you'll drink of the cup that I drink of. What does that mean? Well, Jesus is prophesying their death. You're not going to die a natural death, you're going to be killed. Well, that's not what they asked for. You shall indeed drink the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I'm baptized with all, shall you be baptized. The same baptism that I'm baptized with, you're going to be baptized with. Well, that's the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. And so the answer to the question is yes. But Jesus said in verse 40, To sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Well, who's that? Who? Who God's, who God's prepared. Who are they? Well, Jesus didn't say. He didn't say who they are. And so he says to them, it is not mine to give. You know why? Because he was serving God. See, Jesus was a servant. And uh, servants don't have the right to give positions. You say, Pastor, you better be careful with this here. Jesus was fully God, friend. Don't misunderstand me. But he came to do the will of God the Father. And he came to serve. And he said, greatness is not being served. Greatness is serving. He said, it's not mine to give. He said, you can, eat, you can die for my name. You can be empowered by my Holy Spirit. But what you ask me for you should ask God for. Let me just say something very quickly before we look at verse 41. Would you have the audacity to ask God to sit on the right hand of Jesus? Well, they asked the Son of God, who is equal with God, to sit on the right hand, but I think that ultimately something in their mind, they weren't fully transformed yet about this matter of being a servant. And something wasn't clicking yet, and they were ambitious. But I don't think they would have asked God to sit on the right hand of Jesus when He ruled and reigned, or on the left hand. And so Jesus simply said, this isn't mine to give, that's His answer for him. And then He got to the point. Verse 40, though, we, we'll stray from the point just a bit. When the ten heard this, the t other ten disciples, when they heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Now think about this. Here they are. They're mad at them, at James and John. What are they angry at James and John about? Why are they angry at James and John? Well, they shouldn't have asked Jesus to sit on the right hand and the left. Why were they displeased about it? Well, because if the ten... The ten other dis apostles or disciples realized, this would include Peter and all the rest of them, they realized that if James and John sat on the right hand and on the left hand, they'd have to serve James and John. They'd be less than James and John. And in their minds, they weren't going to say it, but what they thought was that each of them thought they should sit on the right and left hand and be served. And if James and John were asking for it, they thought James and John were asking for something that belonged to them rightfully. And ultimately, my friend, if we're all served, if every one of us is going to be served, who's going to do the serving? What if Jesus granted to the twelve disciples, the twelve apostles, to be on his right hand, maybe in a row, and they could alternate on days being closest to him? So like a revolving right hand. My wife, when she taught school, used to have a favorite student of the day. She'd pick a favorite. His favorite of the day. 
And uh, that way, you know, there's no teacher's pet. Every day there was a different teacher's pet. And so this is teacher, you know, you say teacher's pet, and it was true for that day. And uh, I don't think she always did that, but it was something for fun. The kids liked it, thought it was funny. So we could have, if you will, a um, right-hand disciple of the day. Or even a month. There's 12 months in a year, and eternity's long enough that they'll all get plenty of turns. The ten were displeased because they thought that James and John might get something that they thought they wanted or that they deserved. And all of us think that we deserve to be great. I just want to tell you something. If greatness is what man says it is, then greatness is in opposition to everyone else. Your greatness will deprive someone else of their greatness. Because, friend, if they serve you... If that is greatness, if greatness is being served, there can only be so many servants and only so many that are truly great. Now, there wouldn't be anyone in the world that would be greater than these guys, and so they'd never serve. They would simply be served. And most of us think that being great is to have individuals do for us. I just want to tell you something. The world does not go round if you will, based upon the world's view of greatness. The world stops going round because of the world's view of greatness. Marriages stop because of the world's view of greatness. Friendships cease because of the world's view of greatness. Boy, husband gets married and he just can't wait for his wife to fulfill his needs. And a wife gets married and she just can't wait for her husband to be her prince. And uh, she doesn't see him as a prince sitting on a throne. She sees him as a prince on his knee. Right? And then they get married and they find out he wants me to serve him! Or she wants me to serve her! He wants me to do this and this and this and this. She wants. She just wants me to. Do, do, do. She just wants me to be her slave. He just wants me to be her slave. And both of them, when they got married, thought of greatness the way that's natural for us, being served. And marriages end because of that. He spends all the money. She spends all the money. Every decision we make has to be for her. Every decision we make has to be for him, and they can't get along because both of them want a servant. But they don't want to serve. And you know, marriages work very well with two servants. They do. Marriages work very well with two servants. You know, I should be doing that for you. You shouldn't be doing that for me. You know what? Let's do what you want, not what I want. They, they work wonderfully when there's a servant spirit. Uh, friendships. You know what a friend is? He that hath friends, let him show himself friendly. Hospitality is a demonstration of love. Hospitality is a demonstration of friendship. You know what hospitality is? Serving. Somebody comes to your house, you give them your best seat. You spend your money to feed them. Uh, you take your time to talk about what they want to talk about. You do things to serve them. Hospitality is service. How would you like it if you went to a hotel that emphasized hospitality and hospitality was, we're great, serve us. <coughs> Call them on the phone. Hospitality, uh, yeah, could you, um, would, you, would it be possible to get an extra towel or could we get someone to, and it'd be like, <laughs> Huh. Listen, buddy, my house needs cleaned at home, and I expect you to be there pronto and get it done. And I need my car washed, and I need, and I need, and I need. And the hospitality, no, hospitality is service. Demonstration of love is serving. I'm going to just tell you something. The world goes round on service, not on being served. And greatness, my friend from God's perspective, is not being 
served, but it is serving. You say, Pastor, I understand that, and here's what I'm willing to do. I want everyone in the world to be great, and so I'm going to do them the service of being served, just so that everybody can have an opportunity at God-given greatness, and that's not my calling. You know, I, I'll have to suffer. Listen, I tell you, we're so selfish that that is what we think. It's the way we look at it. Every, they need to be servants. They do need to be servants. How am I going to get served otherwise? I mean, Jesus understood what they needed. And I'm just telling you, Christian, that the apostles have been taught what greatness was many times. And they still hadn't gotten it. Because the two that came to Jesus asked to be number one and number two after him. And the ten were displeased about it because they wanted to be number one. And out of the twelve apostles, the desire on the heart and the, um, the feeling that they deserved it to be number one, the desire of every individual was that I want to be number one. Every one of them felt like they had the right to be number one. Isn't that interesting? You know, we all feel like that. When I was a kid, I sang some silly song uh, that I was made to sing in high school, and it was, we've got eye trouble. I've got eye trouble. Everyone's looking out for number one, me, myself, and eye trouble. Um, and uh, uh, eye trouble is why trouble is getting out of hand. I can't, that's only the chorus, that, but it described all the things. You know what the problem with, with us is? We want to be served. It's all about me. Me, 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 me. And you say, Pastor, that's right. That's the way everybody is. And I don't get anything done for me because they're all so selfish. Right? And the fact is, is that you haven't been transformed unless you can fix your thinking about greatness. Want to be a great husband? You, you know what we think of greatness? Yeah, everybody's going to see my wife. She takes care of me because I'm a great husband. No, great husband's one that does everything for your wife. And it goes against nature. It's not natural for a husband to give up his desires and his wishes for his wife. Great wife serves her husband. Great son serves his parents. Great parents serve their son. And I'm not talking about the world's view, of exalting somebody and lifting them up. Everybody gets their day to shine, if you will. There's no shining. It's just a servant. Nobody notices the servant unless he doesn't do his job. Good servants don't get noticed unless they don't do their job. If they do their job, no one will ever notice them. The job will be done. Well, Jesus called to them and said to them, You know that they which are accounted, accounted has the idea of uh, counted worthy, being appointed to, Accounted to rule over the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them. <laughs> well, did they know that? Right? Lordship. Ruling. Jesus said, the Gentiles, the nations that are without God, you know very well that they understand that ruling is having people serve them. But it shall not, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. And so even the ones that are great, the ones that are really great, rule over those. And so we're going up the tier. I watched an Andy Griffith show, uh, or part of one, I couldn't finish it, but I watched a part of one, and it was uh, Gomer in the Marine Corps. And this is our Andy Griffith church service. You laugh, and maybe you've seen it before, but Gomer's in the Marine Corps, and uh, a fellow that used to be from his hometown that was a uh, um, congressman had come and visited and he noticed that Gomer, he found out that Gomer had been, he liked Gomer, he was from the same place, uh, same area, and so they kind of knew Ken and everything. And um, But he found out Gomer had been a private for three and some odd years. And uh, they said, you know, by now you ought to be a corporal. Well, the fellow, um, the colonel said, well, the reason that is, I'm sure, the only re way a guy could remain a private that long and not be promoted is if they have something on their record. They've done something wrong or they've whatever. And they checked Gomer's record and it was perfect. And so they said, we got to promote Gomer. And, they, and from the top down, they gave orders. And it showed a little kind of a skit 
of the different men going down the chain of command, yelling at the guy below him and saying, why isn't Gomer a corporal? And he goes down, 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 down until the sergeant gets it. And he's like, I can't make Gomer a corporal. He cannot. Uh, he's, not, he's incapable of giving orders. And a corporal has to take charge sometimes. He has to give orders and Gomer can't do that. And he, they, 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 fun, they have all kind of funny little skits about how Gomer tries to, he tries to make Gomer be bossy and Gomer's just not good at that. He's just good at being a private. And I thought, well, that'll work great in my sermon. I'll have the uh, Andy Griffith Sunday school class uh, next thing in our church and we'll be the next greatest thing in the world. You know, that was a popular couple of years ago. Uh, well, anyway, my point is this. You can't be a good servant and get served. And servants are the ones that get the job done. And the ones that get the job done are the ones that are great. You know the great people in the church are? Not the people that stand in front. All the time there are people that come into the church and they want to be in front. And I'll be honest with you, it's because they don't know and understand what it is to be in front. They don't know that along with um, the authority comes the criticism for every decision you make. They don't know that along with the authority comes the responsibility to answer to God for everything that you do. They don't know that uh, when you stand in front of people, uh, it's, it's not everything that is cracked up to be. But people come, they want to stand in front. They want to be the first guy. Now some people are more naturally servants. But I'll tell you who ought to be a natural servant. Not just the people that are naturally... You know what we think a lot of times? Well, you know, that's their gift, being a servant. We kind of pat him on the head. Poor little dumb guy can't do anything worthwhile, so he's got to serve. Don't we? I mean, it's like, well, he can't sing, so, you know, let's let him clean the church. Well, he can't, you know, he can't, he's not a good speaker, he's not personable, he's not affable, and so he probably will never be a great soul winner or a great Sunday school teacher, so, you know, let's let him fix the bus. Uh, let's let him, and we, we find the task that we, that we don't like to do because nobody gives you any credit for it, and we give it to them, and we just think that's their calling, that's their gift. My calling is to serve here. His calling is to serve you. And I know you people aren't like this, but every one of the 12 apostles were. You say, Pastor, it's not exactly like that. I know it's not exactly like that, but it is like that. You want to be great. And you think greatness is what the Gentiles, the nations that were without God, think greatness is. And the fact is it's not. You know who the ones that are great are? The ones with accomplishments. He's a pastor. That, are you sure? Yes. You know how you accomplish things? <coughs> Working. You know how things get done? Working. God give us some finishers. There's all kind of people that uh, want to be the starter of a project. You know, they, they have the vision. It's easy to have a vision. Do you know that? Anybody can have an idea. And we just think we're so brilliant for having an idea. There's nothing great about ideas. Everybody's full of them. Dr. McClure used to say, uh, and he said about opinions, but it's basically the same thing as an idea. He says, you know, he said in opinions like, uh, like an armpit or armpits, he said everybody's got a couple of them, they usually stink. <laughs> and uh, that was his uh, um, idea of opinions. Everybody has them. Everybody, an opinion's an idea about how things ought to be. And we've all got those. God give us some people that don't have ideas but have some muscles to get the work done and some fortitude to do the work when nobody's around to say good job and nobody's around to say, wow, the job got done. You'll never notice the church getting cleaned, but you'll notice if it's not. You'll never notice empty, uh, full pews, but you'll notice when they're empty. You don't notice things that are done, you notice things that are not done because we're all about having it done for us. And God didn't call us to have it done for us, He called us to do it. Now let's just put things in perspective. Who's greater, God or us? Who deserves to be a servant, Jesus or us? You know, I'm going to tell you something. Remember the prodigal son when he went back to his father? He said, even the servants that my father had are better off. Even my father's servants are better off than this. This, he's got a job feeding the swine, feeding the pigs. He's serving pigs. 
And he wants to eat pig food and they won't let him. And he said, this is not... His idea of greatness, he said, it flies... It, just, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. And he said, even my father's servants have food to eat and a place to stay. I'll go back to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no more worthy to be your, called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he said, that'd be good enough. That'd be a lot better. And I just want to tell you something, friend. To be a slave in heaven is a lot better than to burn in hell. I want to tell you something. To serve obnoxious people on this earth is better than for God to snuff out our miserable existence and send us to hell to give us what we deserve. I'm telling you, the lowest position in the world is better than you and I deserve. Hey, how many of us has the right to stand in the presence of God? Some of you would like a job serving a millionaire. Anybody know who Wayne Heising is? He's pretty well known in Fort Lauderdale area um, because, because uh, he got rich on garbage. And um, he's very wealthy. He used to own the Miami Dolphins and um, <laughs> has disassociated himself from that. And I would too if I were him. Um, there's a little dig at the Miami Dolphins. But um, Wayne Heising is very wealthy. And I'll tell you something, a lot of you'd like a job working for Wayne Heising. Matter of fact, it seemed like I knew someone that used to work for him. And it was a good job. What their job was? Not for Wayne Heisinger to inquire about them and their children and, you know, what he could do for them. Their job was to serve him. And I'll tell you something. Many of you would give up your jobs to work for Wayne Heisinger because it would be a pretty high position as a servant. Right? I'm telling you that God in heaven has called us to serve Him, and that's a pretty big appointment. That's big. He didn't call us to sit on His right hand and on His left hand so everybody could look up to us and say, there's the guy that knows God. There's the guy that, that can get anything he wants from Jesus. That'll see you as a servant. And Jesus said, Whosoever of you will be chiefest, shall be servant of all. Jesus said, whichever one of you is right-hand man is going to be the busiest. And the person that he'll be ministering to will be everybody. <coughs> How many want that job? I mean, it'd be okay to be appointed to just serve Jesus. Just whatever Jesus tells you to do, you could be His personal servant. Jesus said, the person that's closest to me in my kingdom will be the one that's serving everybody in the world. In other words, He'll be underneath everybody else. And He said, For the Son of Man, and whosoever you be chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. And Jesus said, if you think that my ministry is about ruling and reigning and having my needs fulfilled, you don't even understand why I came. We'll conclude with this. Look back, if you will, to verse 32. This is right before this happened. This brings us into our context. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And He took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto Him, saying... Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. Then the good news, the third day he shall rise again. Jesus said, we're on our way to Jerusalem for me to be abused, mistreated, and killed. And the disciples after that said, Jesus, in your kingdom, can we sit on your right hand and on your left? Does that fit? Doesn't, does it? It's out of context. Do you know most of us don't fit? We're out of context because our attitude has not been transformed about our purpose. 
Our purpose, my friend, is not to be great, as the Gentiles are great. Our purpose is to be the least. And you want to accomplish greatness, by the way, do you? I should think you'd want to serve Jesus. If you love him, you'll serve him. That's what love is. Boy, I love them. They do so much for me. No. You, I love them. I'd do anything for them. That's what love is. You love somebody, you do anything for them. That's what a friend is. Friends is someone, if you want to, it's not somebody that do anything for you, it's you doing anything for them. You want to be a good friend? Hey, you can have as many, you can be a friend to as many people as you'd like to. You just can't have as many friends as you'd like to. Talk about friendship all the time. Most, most people that, that really know how things are would say, I can count on one hand how many real friends I have. And if you really think about it, people that would do anything for you, how many of your friends would sell their house to keep you alive? How many friends would give up their job? How many friends would do anything for you? How many of you have like that? And I dare say, if you're honest about it, you could count them on one hand. And if you could count more than one, you'd be doing pretty good. But you know, you could be a friend to anybody. Pastor, you saying I should sell my house for someone to meet their needs? I'm saying if you're a friend, you'll meet their needs. If you want to be a friend, you do anything. Whatever it takes, you just do it. And the more you do for someone else, it's not doing so that people can say, wow, look at them. It's doing so that their needs can be met. The greater you are. From God's perspective. How many of us set out our day and go about to serve Jesus? You know, we say, let's serve Jesus today. What do we think of? Collecting trophies. Finishing. And getting the reward, the crown. The recognition. The accolades. But when we pray, begin our day and say, today, Lord, I want to serve you. And I ask you to give me the ability to do it. I ask you to empower me with your spirit. Fill me with it. God, help me to be a servant today. What do you mean? God, today I want to lay down my life. I want to be a friend. I want to show that I love. That's the process of what God's trying to do in your life and what He's trying to accomplish. And greatness is serving, friend. Greatness is not I cannot because I. Greatness is I can because they. Or I must because they. You know the phrase, a need seen is, or a job seen is a task assigned. Fits for a servant. They need, I must. God needs, I will. And that's a servant. And so I would ask you this morning, we've preached about it for the third week. This is the third message on greatness, the Bible way. And my question is this, when is it going to come to the place that you don't agree with what greatness is, but that you become great. See, greatness is our calling. God's called you to be great. And He wants you to be great. Not so that you can receive the accolades and the crown, but because that's what God needs is great people. In other words, great ministers. And a minister is a servant. And the greatest is the least. And the greatest is servant of all. Is that you? How do you see yourself? When you see yourself and you think great, I want to be great, how do you see yourself? What are you? Are you the slave? Or are you the master? Heavenly Father, help us not just to understand the truth, but God, convict us with it in such a way that we would see how wicked our self-worshipping concept of greatness is. And our prayer this morning, Father, is that you would transform us to be great in the way that Jesus is. I pray it in His name. Amen. We're going to have an invitation this morning, and I think that it is self-describing. Page 375 in your songbook is a hymn, I Gave My Life for Thee.